Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you to the Orbit for hosting me. Um, great. So, the puzzle of the universe. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you kind of what, what that puzzle is, is to me. And I think it's, I hope if you can remember all the way back, I don't know how many of you did science or physics or when last you did it, the way, the way it's taught is what I describe as a reductionist approach, right? So we, we break things down into smaller bits and understand those bits and see how they can fit together. And I, I guess I'm uh, very stubborn, and so that stuck with me, and that's what my research is, right? It's, it's looking at what are the smallest bits that we need to fit together in the universe, right? So how far can we take this process? So the puzzle is, what are the basic building blocks, the unbreakable Lego pieces that, that have nothing smaller than themselves? What do we need to make up everything around us? And then once we have those, what are the interactions between these basic building blocks that make them form all the complexity that we see around us? Right, so this is not, it's not a new question, uh, and scientifically kind of started with the elements, right? So elements were supposed to be the first thing of this, right? So carbon is different to iron, which is different to, hang on, I, I, have, a, I have a new toy. Some, some things might go wrong. Some things are going wrong. <laughs> right. Okay. So... Does this work? Right. So carbon is different to iron. These are different things. They are fundamental. So at some point, the understanding was these are the elements, hence the name, right? The periodic table of the elements. This is what we need. It's quite a few things. But this table was really useful because this table led to a structure, right? All of these things, if you go along a row, differed in charge by one unit, so you look at it and you're like, well, maybe there's something smaller that has like one unit of charge and it's just being added on, right? So we, we dug a bit further into this and then we found that elements aren't the basic fundamental thing, but the smallest unit of an element is an atom, right? So an atom is the smallest piece of something that fits into this table until we split it more. And so if we look at helium up here, right, it has a charge of two, so it has two protons, normally two neutrons, normally two electrons. And if we try to represent a helium atom to show the structure inside, we end up with a picture like this. Okay, so now we have our electrons Come on, don't fail me now. We have our electrons out here, two of them. And then inside we have two protons, one up there, one down there, and two neutrons. And here we're seeing that not only were the elements not the basic building blocks, right? The basic unit of an element, an atom, we knew was made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And further than that, the protons and neutrons were made of smaller things called quarks. Who has never heard of a quark except in the promo for this talk? Okay, so not going too slowly. So the, the, the quarks are the things inside protons and neutrons. Right, there are two of them. And if you ever doubted that scientists and artists were akin and that scientists were completely imaginative, we gave them the names up and down. Just <laughs> wonderful, wonderful things. So we have these two up and down quarks and two up quarks and a down quark combined to make a proton. Two down quarks and an up quark combined to make a neutron. And then we still have our electrons kind of hanging out outside and as far as we know, they are fundamental, right? So in order to make up everything that is in the world, essentially, 
it's all different combinations of these three particles. There's some numbers on here, so everything I say you should hear with an extra statement on the end that's as far as we know, right? Everything, everything I'm going to tell you works, works really well, could be wrong in a way where it works up to a point and then it, it, it doesn't work anymore, right? It's a good approximation. It's like when you were in high school, when you were doing science and you used like 10 for G because it made the calculations easier. And then if you got to university, they were like, no, no, no. Acceleration due to gravity is not 10, it's 9.8. Key difference, right? So if we're wrong, it's going to be something like that, right? Where, where what we have now works really well. But, but with what we've done so far, we know that at least down to a size of 10 to the minus 18, so that's 0 0.18 zeros and then like a 1, right, uh, of a meter. So, so down to very small distances. As far as we can tell, the electron has no internal structure. It is a fundamental particle. It's one of these Lego pieces that I want to study. And uh, it's the same for the quarks. The quarks have been tested a bit further, down to 10 to the minus 19. And then just something about atoms, right? So if the nucleus in this picture was the size of, um, like, the top of a beer mug, right? Like 10 centimeters rare diameter. Then the electron cloud would extend 10 kilometers outside of that, right? So just to give you some idea of of the scale of these things. So this is all we need, right? We need these four particles, so I've thrown this other guy in there uh, at the bottom, right? Up quark, down quark, and then these things called leptons. One is an electron, which is in the atom. The other one is called an electron neutrino. There's not going to be a quiz after this, so you don't need to remember any of the names. Okay, but it's it's a cousin of the electron, and we see it when there's uh, radioactive decay, right? We see these neutrinos come out. So that's all we need uh, for the fundamental particles. But as we try to study these things, we find this pattern repeated a couple of times. So while these are the only particles that are in everything you've ever touched or seen. Uh, yeah, probably good enough. Right. There is there's two other columns which have the same structure, right? They're they're not normally present because they're heavier, and I'll get back into this later, but heavier, more massive means more energy, and the universe is essentially lazy. It likes to be in the lowest energy state. So whenever any of these other guys are produced, they find a way to get down to that first column which is what everything is made of. But this is the full list, as far as we can tell, so far, of particles of matter. So 12, that's it. That's all we need. So the next question is, how do these particles interact? So let's start by talking about something I hope everyone is okay with. If we have a positive charge and a negative charge, there will be an interaction between them that causes them to be attracted to each other. Right? They will move towards each other. And there's, there's a field, and somehow they know, and there's some magic. But what we, what we find is actually it's a bit less magical but a bit more confusing is each of these guys are constantly sending out little signals in all directions everywhere right so our positive charge is always sending out these signals signified by those gammas at the top which our negative charge will release will receive and our negative charge will say there's a positive charge over there let's go that way Right, And in the same way, our negative charge is doing the same thing, and this is how interactions take place. For every interaction in nature, there is a particle being exchanged. It's not one of the particles I mentioned earlier. Right, Those are the particles that make up matter. 
These are now the particles responsible for carrying the information about an interaction. So this is how the matter particles communicate, how they interact, how they talk to each other. For this interaction, this is the electromagnetic interaction, these, are, these particles are photons. Right? Photons are particles of light. I'm not going to talk about this more than on this slide, but at this scale, at this fundamental level, all particles are waves, and all waves are particles, and if you haven't studied physics and that doesn't give you a headache, congratulations. Um, but So there's this duality, so light you know of as a wave, it's also particles. An interesting thing about this is that means that these photons travel at the speed of light. The signal travels at the speed of light, right? In the case of electromagnetism, the force, the interaction has an infinite range. This means that there is a completely negligible, but actually there force, interaction, I'm trying not to use the word force in case you haven't noticed, uh, interaction between the electrons in my body and the electrons on the moon. Right? It's negligible, there's a big distance, it's a weak force, but there is an interaction. And as I walk up and down the stage, the distance between me and the moon is changing, slightly, but it is changing. And so the force, the interaction between my electrons and the electrons on the moon is changing. But when I move, the electrons on the moon only find out that I'm further away and the force should be weaker when the next photon from me gets there. So the information about the interaction is carried at the speed of light. And this is true for all interactions, all interactions I care about. So, right, how do particles interact? Well, hopefully everyone's happy that gravity is an interaction between matter particles and electromagnetism is, is the force between positive and negatively charged particles. The strong force is the force between the quarks that holds them together inside protons. Again, another triumph of imaginative naming. Uh, we know it's strong because we know these, these protons are in this very small space and they're positively charged. So they should be flying apart. Right? But there's the strong force inside the proton holding the quarks together and the remnants of that force the little leftover bits are so strong that they overcome the electromagnetic repulsion. Right? So that's something to give you an idea. That's why it's called a strong force. It's so much stronger than electromagnetism. So that's the strong force. And of course, the strong force you know, helps things stick together. So the particle for the strong force is the gluon. Um, the weak force is weaker than the strong force. It's the one responsible for radioactive decay, and it has some force carriers as well, the W and Z bosons. Um, and then I have this question mark under gravity, because gravity doesn't fit into this framework. So in my field, we have this mathematical language. We have a model that explains this really well. We can describe what happens really well, but we have no clue how to incorporate gravity into this, because gravity is a curving of space-time. If, if you were at earlier Science and Cocktails talks, you'd have, you'd have come across that. So gravity is this curving of space-time. We don't know how to incorporate it into this framework. But luckily, gravity is really weak, so we can ignore it. No, gravity is really weak, right? I mean, um, I, can, I can do my favorite cheesy demonstration. And I'm very cheesy, but this is my favorite cheesy demonstration. Okay, This is my demonstration of gravity being really weak. Okay, So the full gravity on the Earth is acting on my little clicker. And the only thing stopping it falling through my fingers is the electro electromagnetic repulsion between the end of my finger and this thing. 
So gravity really is just weak, right? It's known, I know, it keeps us going around the sun, it's useful, but it's weak. <laughs> okay. So our fundamentals, fundamental particle list has to be expanded a little bit. We put them in a different color because now we have these particles that are responsible for carrying the information about a force. So we have a few more particles, but we can tell the difference. They behave really differently. So the, the matter particles are, are highlighted as matter, and then we have the force-carrying particles. Cool. And then random segue. Everyone knows who this is. Most famous thing. Don't all shout at once. E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So the important thing about that is that energy is mass, right? Energy equals mass. I know it's a bit of a crazy segue, but it's important. So where was I going with this? Right, I was going with, so let's talk about our masses, right? So if energy is mass, how is your mass energy? So let's think about this a little bit. My mass is, for the most part, the mass of the atoms that fit together to make me. That mass is, for the most part, the masses of the nuclei of those atoms. Right? If I someday weigh 80 kilograms again, then the effect of the masses of the electrons to my total mass would be about 20 grams. So we can ignore the mass of the electrons, and my mass is really just the sum of the masses of the nuclei. And the mass of the nuclei is really just, to a large extent, not exactly, the sum of the masses of the protons and neutrons in these nuclei. Okay. The protons and neutrons are made of quarks. The protons and neutrons their mass is not the sum of the masses of the quarks inside them. Right? The, the, masses of, the mass of a proton compared to the masses of the quarks, the, those three quarks inside them is, I should have thought about this beforehand, MEV, GV, it's like more than a thousand. Right? So it's definitely not the sum of the masses. And the reason is the strong force is so strong that there's so much energy between those quarks that most of the mass of protons and neutrons is the energy stored in those bonds, right? So that's how energy is mass can be related to your mass. Okay, just let that sink in. Okay, so then we can go a step further, right? But then what is the mass of the quarks? and the electron. Because they're, they're not made of anything. And if energy is mass, does that mean that like they're just always in a jet? Like, what's, what's going on there? And the problem gets bigger than that, right? We have a model that describes these interactions really, really well. But within this model, mathematically and um, conceptually, any of these particles actually having mass doesn't make sense. It breaks the mathematics. It, it just, it's inconceivable, but they have mass. So, so the idea to deal with this was to think about them as behaving like they have mass, but not actually having mass. So it sounds like a bit of a trick, and maybe it is, but remember, when we say a particle has mass, that means we measure a property that looks like mass. So in this case, the theory was that maybe there's some other field that's everywhere that interacts with all the particles and interacts with them differently because of the particles. And so you can think of it kind of like this other field being an ocean and light particles are, you know, thin, long fish and they can go through it really quickly and heavy particles are like big, slow turtles, and they can't move through it as fast. So there's this field everywhere, and, and these particles trying to move through this field at different speeds 
gives them a property that makes them look like they have mass to us. So this keeps this model that we have, which works really, really well, but allows us to fix the one bit where it didn't work well, where like particles actually appear to have mass. So what I've just described to you is the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs field, uh, something you, you might have heard about. Uh, the, the, one of the consequences of this idea was the prediction that a new particle must exist is called the Higgs boson. It was discovered in 2012 by the Atlas and CMS collaborations and the following year, the theorists who were responsible for the model were awarded the Nobel Prize. So with energy is mass, we have to expand our fundamental particles list and add in the Higgs boson um, because these particles have mass. This lovely graphic um, is from Wikipedia, and I'm going to quickly just put it on a white background so you can see there's a lot more information there, but there is no quiz at the end of the talk, so we don't really care. I've been talking a long time about this model we have, right? We have this model, it describes things, it's amazing, so here it is. Um, and we have about 40 minutes. So that term is the gluons. That's the kinetic energy term of the gluons. That's it. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so that's, that's incredible shorthand for the model we have. And if you're really, really geeky, you can get a t-shirt with an even more contracted version of that on it. But this is the theory. And it works really well. And there's something in it that I want to talk about before moving on, which is I need to say more about the strong force. Because the strong force is incredibly different from all the other forces that you've encountered. Right? So every time you've... <clears throat> interaction. Interactions. Force is a nasty word. We, we don't want forces. Okay, so... All the interactions you've heard about, right? It makes sense to you that as the particles that are feeling the interaction move further apart, the interaction gets weaker, right? If something is further away, it should affect you less. Strong force, strong interaction is not like that. The strong interaction... has a strange thing where if I have two quarks that are bound together and I start trying to pull them apart, like I can take an electron and a positron and I can pull them apart and I'll eventually end up with an electron on this side and a positron on this side, right? We can do this. The electron was isolated and discovered over 150 years ago and this is like the height of this reductionist view of physics that I subscribe to, right? So we can separate these things, we can put this electron in like a special box, and then we can prod it and poke it and figure out how it works, and that's how you end up with cell phones and computers and everything, right? That depends on this fundamental understanding of an electron. So being able to separate it from everything else and isolate it and say, how does it behave if I kick it? How does it behave if I kick it differently? Okay. So with quarks, though, if I start trying to pull my quarks apart, the force doesn't decrease. The interaction doesn't decrease. So I start separating them, but they're still bound together. They're still a state. I, c I can't isolate just one. And so I keep trying to separate them further and further apart. And as I do this, I'm putting in energy. And energy is mass. So eventually, I, I start with a quark, and it's... should have introduced this earlier. So it's, physically, this has to be a quark and an anti-quark. So all the particles I mentioned, there's also antiparticles. There should be even numbers of particles and antiparticles in the universe. There are more particles. We don't know why. It's a big deal. But so... <laughs> Quark and anti-quark. 
putting in the energy, more energy, more energy, more energy, eventually I end up creating mass. So I've got this quark here, and an anti-quark pops up on this side. And I've got this anti-quark here, and a quark pops up on this side. They just come out of this energy I've been pulling it, putting in, and end up with a quark and an anti-quark on this side, and a quark and an anti-quark on this side. So this thing I want to do, which is just get one quark and put it in a box and poke it and figure out how it works so that I can come up with the next equivalent of electronics, is just impossible. So the only way I can test the, inter the interactions between the quarks is inefficient. Okay, so imagine two cars colliding. If two cars collide and the collision is not very hard, then like you get some outer body work damage and you can say, okay, the cars collided. But if I get the cars to go really, really fast, then maybe I can get them to hit each other hard enough that the two engines collide. And then when those engines collide and they break apart, I can look at the pieces and figure out how a car's engine works. So that's kind of what we have to do, right? So, so that we, we have protons, and we collide the protons really, really hard. And if we get them hard enough, then the actual interaction happens between the quarks beside them. Something fantastic will happen. They'll create one of these other particles, not from the first column, that we don't normally can see, we, we're not used to, and that'll quickly decay to particles we know about, and we'll see those. And then we say, we go to this theory that was up, let's put it back up, we go here and we say, okay, what were we expecting to see? And we compare that to what we saw. And that's how we test this theory. And it's a little bit more complicated than that because through the magic of quantum mechanics, everything is probabilistic. So if I just had one of these collisions, I have no information. All the model really tells me is if you have a million of these collisions and you count the number of times you produce two electrons, what will you get? Right, so that's what we count and then we go to the model and we compare them and fix all the parameters. So in order to, the latest and greatest technology for throwing protons together really, really hard is the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a picture of mostly Geneva on the Swiss-French border. The red lines signify where there are accelerators. Most of these structures are underground. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is, is the biggest one. So we accelerate the protons with electric fields and we keep them going in circles with magnetic fields. And we're limited by how fast we can make them go before they collide by how strong our magnetic field is and how big a radius the ring is. Because with a bigger radius, we can make do with a lower magnetic field because we don't have to curve it around as much. So the, the biggest one is the Large Hadron Collider. It's big and it collides hadrons. Yes, imagination. Um, right. So we start with a bottle of gas, uh, just a bottle of hydrogen, relatively easy to purchase these days. You put it in an electric field, you can strip the electron off the proton, and then the protons move through the series of accelerators until they get to the Large Hadron Collider, where they get up to their highest energy, which is 13 TeV, which should mean nothing to you, just believe me, it's super high, they're going at 99.99, many nines, times the speed of light, but not quite the speed of light, because they have mass. And they collide at four locations. So the Alice experiment is built up around one of these collision points, and they are tailored to study collisions between gold nuclei, which form hot, dense regions similar to the beginning of the universe. The LHCb collaboration is focused on studying this discrepancy between matter and antimatter that we have. 
Um, and then ATLAS and CMS are the general purpose detectors uh, that kind of measure all the proton stuff and try to constrain the model as much as we can. This is what the LHC looks like. So this is inside the tunnel. These are essentially magnets and a beam pipe. Right? So most of what you're seeing is a superconducting magnet with a huge magnetic field. And the beam pipe is here. There are protons going in opposite directions inside those two tubes. And at those four interaction points, they collide. So the energy of the various things, so per proton, we have the equivalent energy of 100 milligrams moving at 20 centimeters per second, so a really fast mosquito. The protons don't go around one at a time because we can't aim them that well. We send them around in bunches of protons with like 10 to the 34. That's a 10 with 34 zeros behind it. Protons in each bunch. And the energy in each bunch is equivalent to a person on a motorbike going quite fast. Right? 300. Thank you. Ooh. Okay. It's, bu it's, it's bubbling. Okay. Um, person 300 kilograms, 150 kilometers an hour. And then the beam, I forget how many bunches there are in a beam. I should know this, I'm sorry. But each beam is many bunches that collide. And per beam, there's the equivalent energy of 159 kilograms of TNT or 32 kilograms of chocolate. Okay, so these collisions happen at these four interaction points once every 25 nanoseconds. That's 40 million times a second. And what we do is we just have a really awesome digital camera that takes an image of what happens in the collision. So my digital camera is Atlas. It's about 45 meters long and about 24 meters high. There are some images of people here to give you a sense of scale. There's one there, one there, and the protons come in from that end and that end and collide in the middle. And then we have various different types of technologies to help us go through pattern recognition algorithms and identify what really happened. So I just want to point out this kind of central bit here. And if you can for a second, just imagine removing that from Atlas. Okay. So how do you do? That's what it looks like. So this is now not a drawing. This is a photograph of that central bit. You can see the central bit in the middle there, ready to be inserted. And this is the rest of Atlas and there is a person there for scale. Right, so this is our detector um, at Geneva. It's cool, we do science with it. <laughs> okay, so how do we do that? Let's watch. Cool, so we're zooming along in the LHC, in the tunnel, going to cross the border soon. And then we're going to become one of the protons. Zooming along, heading towards Atlas. There's another buddy coming in from the other direction. And when we get to the center, there will be a collision. And from this point on, this is a real event. This is something that was detected by the Atlas detector and going through our various pattern recognition algorithms. We have determined that in all likelihood in this collision, one of the carriers of the electroweak force, the weak force was produced, the Z boson, and it decayed into two of the heavy electrons from the second column, a mu one, a mu plus, and a mu minus, and we detected those. So there's an important thing there that you might have missed. I said, most likely. 
Because remember, we have all we know, all we detect is the two muons. So all we can say is this is an event which produced two muons, but we measure their energy and momentum, and then we can say, well, this, these two muons look like they came from a particle with a particular mass, just by adding together the energy and momentum that we measured of the two muons. And we do that like a million times, and we just fill a graph, right? So at each mass, how many did we count? And then we go to our theory, and our theory will say what we should have seen, but it's all probabilistic. So it's all like, so at this point, at the mass of these two muons, which is probably close to 90 g, let me use real English, 90 times the mass of a proton, right? This is more than 90% certain to be a Z boson, but there's absolutely no way of knowing. All we know is the total number we measured at this mass is equal to the total number predicted from our theory, which includes them, the ones that come from Z bosons, or the ones that come from Higgs bosons, or the ones that come from anything else that can give us this. So this is how we do the comparison. We count how many events happen with a certain topology and compare that to the theory. On the next slide, we're going to look at this happening. Okay, so your x-axis is going to be the mass of four leptons. So in this case, this is the mass of two. We added them together. It's going to be the total mass of four. And you'll see us gathering data, and you'll see like how many we measure at each mass. The black points with the little error bars are the data. The colored solid bits are the theoretical prediction. Right? And we can see as we collect data over two years from a little while ago, how well we did. So here we go. Okay, let me just go through that again. So we're just adding up the total mass of four leptons that we had in Atlas. Then we're going to count the number of events. The back points are the data, and the other colors are what our theory tells us. Help. Okay. So great. Everything works, right? The data, the theory, all good. And a little bit of something going on around a hundred. That doesn't look good. So what has happened is in our theoretical prediction we said, give me the prediction assuming there is no Higgs boson. And then we got this discrepancy between the data and the prediction. And then we said, well, add in a Higgs boson with a mass of 125 GeV, 125 times the mass of a proton. And that fits really well. Um, and that's how we observe and discover new particles. So, so this, is, this is our evidence from our model. This comparison between what the theory says should be happening with what we measure. So that's it, right? Uh, we have everything. We know all the particles. We know how they fit together. We have the Higgs boson. Everything's cool. We understand everything. Obviously not. I don't know how I'd feel about that. I might be out of a job. Uh, but more importantly, the, the Higgs boson that was discovered in 2012, we're still toying around with. So we don't know if it's exactly what the model predicts for the plain vanilla Higgs boson. This theory was first postulated in the 1960s, and between the 1960s and 2012, nobody saw it. And we had no idea what mass... Well, we had some idea but that idea conveniently kept moving up as we kept not finding it. Um, but 
But in the meantime, a lot of models for other things that could look just like it, but had other nice uh, benefits came into play. So now we're busy studying this new particle to see exactly what flavor it is. Is it just the, the bare bones, Higgs boson, or is it more than that? Additionally, there are things we don't have answers for. We don't know why this structure we have in this table of the particles of matter is repeated twice. Right? Why are there three columns in that table? Why not five columns of matter? We, we don't have an answer for that, and that's, it's unsatisfactory. Right? Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? This is something we've observed, and, and we can't really explain it, and we, we want to explain it. We think we should be able to explain it. Right? If you look at astrophysical measurements, which are based on the premise that everything we've determined here on Earth is the same out in space, then there's dark matter, which if we understand gravity and we understand the standard model of particle physics, we don't know what it is. But out there in space, we see heavy objects orbiting each other. And when we measure their masses, they don't have enough mass to be orbiting each other. So there's something else out there, and we don't know what it is. And then we see that while there's not enough mass to keep those things orbiting, the universe is expanding and accelerating faster than we think it should, so then there's something called dark energy. right? And so we want to understand all of these things. We want to know all of these things, and we want to, more importantly, well, as importantly, incorporate gravity into this, right? So gravity is like the first interaction that we understood. But it, it sits outside of this theoretical framework. And so being able to combine these two frameworks, to have a true theory that describes all the interactions, is a bit of the end goal. And that's not completely... Um, Impossible. So, so the Higgs boson is wonderful because if anything has mass, it should get its mass from the Higgs boson, unless it's totally, super, completely different. So now that we have a Higgs boson kind of detected, we hope that doing precision measurements on it will lead us to some hint as to what's out there. Okay. So I just, I'm just gonna. That is not the thing. Mention one idea. Um, so this is an idea for why gravity is so weak. And the idea is that we don't actually live in a world with three spatial dimensions. We're, well, we do. Well, but we live embedded in a universe of four spatial dimensions. But we are stuck on the surface of this world. So just like a surface in our three-dimensional world is two-dimensional, a surface in a four-dimensional universe will be three-dimensional. So we live on a three-dimensional surface of a truly four-dimensional space. And gravity is acting mostly in that other dimension. And that's why it looks different to us. And in this way, we can incorporate gravity into this model. But of course, then we have to see some signs of these extra dimensions. And there are signs we could see at the Large Hadron Collider. I mean, it depends on the parameters, but we could start producing little miniature black holes that will quickly evaporate. We'll start seeing like energy and momentum conservation go away. So this is the type of thing that we will continue to look for. I'm sorry if uh, some of you feel a bit cheated. I know there were some questions that were uh, in the promo for my talk. So, um, right, let's go through them quickly. What are we made of? M mostly carbon. <laughs> are we really made of stardust? Yes, that's where carbon's formed, otherwise everything would be hydrogen, right? The stars are where hydrogen becomes denser things. Have we found the most fundamental pieces that make up the matter in the universe? We don't know. 
What is a quark? A fundamental particle or a piece of cheese? A type of cheese? Both. <laughs> what is mass and how do particles get mass? What do large particle colliders like the LHC really do? I think I've already spent some time on that. If you're still not clear, buy me a drink after the talk. We can talk some more. It'll be fun. Um... How many scientists does it take to find a new particle? So for the electron, it was one. And for the Higgs boson, it was approximately 7,000. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I am uh, humbled by the turnout in your presence, and I hope you learned something and had a